Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on Women Negotiating Salary, timely during Women's History Month. My name is Catherine, Dr. Katherine Schwab, and I am Director of the School of Communication, Arts, and Media, or SOCAM, in the College of Arts and Sciences, and Professor of Art History and Visual Culture in the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. Some acknowledgments are in order. I would like to thank Richard Greenwald, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and the SOCAM Departments of Communication, English, Modern Languages and Literatures, and Visual and Performing Arts. Also, Janet Canapa, Assistant Vice President of Alumni Relations, as well as Dion Gray Wilson, SOCAM Program Coordinator, Jean Danielle, Director of Operations and Budget Manager of, of the College of Arts and Sciences, and Jamie DiStefano, Media Specialist. Additionally, a great thanks to Maurice Rose, Chair of Visual and Performing Arts, and Kimberly Nikolenko, Director of Career Engagement in the College of Arts and Sciences Office of Career and Professional Development. Maurice and Kim will join us for the Q&A portion of the webinar. SOCAM annually hosts an alumni panel with each department represented. This year we changed course to take advantage of a Zoom webinar format while focusing on a specific topic, women negotiating salary. The urgency of this topic is underscored by publications within the last two months. Princeton University Press published the book, Women Don't Ask, Negotiation and the Gender Divide. The Wall Street Journal published an article within the last two weeks entitled Women Negotiating Salary and Letters to the Editor as a follow-up. These publications reflect the need to know more as well as learning when to ask and when not to ask. This brings us to our guest speaker, Lindsay Othier, class of 2006. Lindsay was an art history major and upon graduation began working for Fortune 100 companies, including Gartner, FactSet, and UBS, driving employer branding, recruiting, and marketing strategies. She is currently the head of employer branding and campus recruiting at Danone. Lindsay is a regular participant in our Art History and Visual Culture Alumni Forum which takes place every three years. Moreover, she joined three other alumni several years ago on campus to discuss the topic of women negotiating salary. We hope today's presentation will give all of us a better understanding of the need for women to negotiate salary in the larger sense and tips to determine when to ask. After Lindsay's presentation, we will have Q&A you can post your questions in the Q&A feature at any time. My colleagues, Maurice and Kim, will serve as moderators and relay questions to Lindsay. Please welcome Lindsay Othier. Thank you so much, Kathy. Really excited to be here today. I appreciate uh, you inviting me on uh, for this uh, important topic. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lindsay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Really excited to be here to chat with all of you about this topic. Uh, I was really touched to be asked and I'm gonna be sharing a combination of my personal experiences as well as uh, some tips and research that you know I did in preparation for today as well. Um, to, so I'm going to be covering three sections. First section is going to be on my career journey. So you get a little bit of an idea of me and how I got to where I am today. The second piece is going to be on why I really think you should consider negotiating your salary. And then the next section is going to be on some tips on how you can negotiate uh, your salary. So this is um, as Kathy touched on, I was an art history major here at Fordham, and I had a really great experience. The art history program is fantastic, in my opinion. Um, I had a really great time studying art history. Time for me to venture out and get started on my first job. Uh, I had decided ultimately that 
while I loved studying art history, it wasn't something I wanted to do long term for a career. So it kind of left me in a little bit of a jam. I was like, great, this is my senior year and I've decided I want to do something to be successful and I'm not really sure what I want to do. So luckily I had a fellow art history ma a major at the time um, had landed me, helped me land an internship at a recruitment agency and they offered me a full-time job upon, which was super when. And one of the really great things about this job was the recruiting agency we had a lot of clients and different um, companies that they opened in the Franklin County area in a variety of different industries, from the pharmaceutical industry, from the marketing industry, as well as the finance industry. And I really got to learn all about the different potential career paths one could take in, in the local area, which was really exciting for me. So I decided at this time that I was going to, like all the investment bankers and hedge fund people I'd read about, I was going to go make my millions at UBS. So I made a move to the corporation, which was uh, in Stanford, Connecticut at the time. And uh, I had a slight miscalculation there though. In 2008, which was at the peak of the financial meltdown. So I got there and instead of making millions, it was more at the time like, oh, this is how we reorg and lay off and you know, do more with less kind of a vibe. So it wasn't quite exactly what I expected, but I made a lot of great connections there. And one of them said, I've got a great opportunity makeup company and the position was in New York City which I just thought was the coolest thing that could happen to me would be a job in New York City so I went and uh, and this is I'll share a little bit about negotiation but this was the first time uh, I would hit kind of like a I would say a miscalculation around negotiation so what I didn't factor in about a job in the city was the cost of commuting the New York City taxes and those expensive New York City lunches. So when all was said and done, I actually ended up making less money uh, than I had at previously at UBS, although I was getting free lipstick and makeup. So there was that perk. However, not exactly moving me forward in terms of my career I was looking to do. So when FactSet called, which if you aren't familiar with them, they're a financial software company in Norwalk and a really great company. I jumped on the opportunity to go actually able to shift my career from recruiting, which is what I had started right out of college, and to what is now called marketing, which is basically, you can think of that as where recruiting and marketing meet. So this was really exciting. I was like, this is my passion. I love this. And I actually felt my major play in well here. It was very visual. It was a lot about how do things look, design, being creative. So it was a good, a good mix. So well, a friend of mine from Gartner called me up and said, I have a great opportunity here for what you're doing, for more money and more scope and a leadership type position. So I jumped at the opportunity to be able to join them. And I had a really great run at Gartner and learned a lot. Quick plug here, if you're local in the area, it's a great company located in Stanford, Connecticut. So definitely check them out if that's uh, something on your mind. But I also here had my kid. And uh, I had my kid, I also had my, I also got the baby. So it was a great, interesting time for me uh, in terms of growth and change at Gartner, which ultimately, which is another point I'll get to in a little bit around negotiating, was it changed my financial dynamics a little bit uh, when I got divorced. I definitely loved my opportunity. And when I was ready to take my next step, one thing that was high on my list was compensation. My situation had changed. So EPAM came along. And they were able to give me an opportunity uh, that allowed me to have more flexibility, make a bit more money, uh, and lead a global team, which was really an exciting opportunity for me, which was all going really well. And then COVID hit, and uh, there were some changes going on at EPAM, and America just happened to give me a call and said, hey, we have another opportunity for, you know, another leadership opportunity. So I jumped on the chance to take that. So I also, at that time too, in my career, when thinking about things around what kind of company do I want to work for, why does it matter, and what's important, to know North America also has a huge commitment to giving back and social good. And I'm going to move on just to a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm an avid, avid runner. I'm a skier. I'm a self-improvement enthusiast. So I'm always trying to tweak my smoothie or listen to some new podcast on how I can get better at presenting. And then I'm a mom. 
And I'm also a Connecticutian. I was born and raised uh, in Richfield, Connecticut, went to school here. So uh, I am a local to Connecticut. So the next section I'm gonna talk about is why I really think that you should negotiate. So this is a combination of information that I've researched as well as anecdotes from my own experience. So the first reason that I think it's really important is that it will actually cost you to not negotiate. And it's not a small sum of number. There's something called the compounding effect, which over time means um, that if you don't negotiate, you're essentially leaving something towards like hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table. And this is based off of a small difference of whether you're going to come in in your initial job for say, making $50,000 or $55,000. So it may seem small when you're at the beginning, but over the course of your 40 year on average career, it's gonna make an impact. And you can also think about this too in, if you come in at 50, this will also determine the percentage of your four, money that goes into your 401k. So that 4% will be based off of this number. The percentage of your bonus will come out of this number. And I think one to think about too is your next job typically will tie around currently what you're making. So. Over time, the price of not negotiating is expensive. The upside is research has showed that men who have negotiated salaries, uh, they typically increase them by an average of 7.4%, which if you flip that equation means over time, making substantially more money. Research has shown that when women who consistently negotiate their salaries will typically earn about 1 million more over their lifetimes on average than those who don't. And recruiters also expect you to negotiate. I know as a woman for myself, I'm often worried about how I will be perceived, you know, especially with all the research around you know, women coming off too aggressive and that being potentially a negative, but the research which lean in if you haven't read the book by Sheryl Sandberg, is a really fabulous book, and it all they now have a website where they've done even more research and give a lot of tips on how you can negotiate. And they found that 80% of recruiters report that candidates that negotiate make a better impression than those who just accept. So while there's often you know that feeling that maybe it won't be well received, uh, you know recruiters are expecting you to have this conversation. And some other important stats around women specifically why I think this matters is that women typically make less money than men, depending on which uh, report you read, it's about 80%, 80 cents to the dollar. And there's two other interesting stats here is the second piece is they have less years to work. So often women are the ones that step out of the workforce to have children or they go on maternity leave and things like that. And over time, they might take a part-time role which ultimately means in that net that they have fewer years to work to earn money in terms of their lifetime. And then to compound that, they live longer. So typically we're outliving men, um, you know, we're living to 81 on average and men are living to 76. So we're actually even living longer. So all the more reason why it's really important that we're thinking about our long-term financial growth and why this is, matters over time. And finally, divorce. Um, I, I hope that this is something uh, that not everybody has to go through, but the reality is this day and age, 50% of marriages do end in divorce. And you can see here from some of the stats, uh, you know, typically women, you know, 85% of them are lacking financial confidence, which then <clears throat> causes them to abdicate their role in long-term financial planning. And unfortunately, in terms of the stats for women who do get divorced, 77% of divorced women and widows said they've been hit with financial surprises like secret accounts after their marriages had ended. And they're also their standard of living dropped significantly as opposed to where men's, where they increased. So while this won't be everybody, 50% is, an, is a decent amount of number where I think it's really important to consider your financial earnings. And with that, negotiating to make sure over time you are building yourself a nice financial net. I put in this fun little quote here, this may be dating myself to some of the students, but there's this great song from the this from Sunscreen, called Sunscreen, and it's, don't expect anyone else to support you. Maybe you'll have a trust fund, maybe you'll have a wealthy spouse, but you never know when either one might run out. So anyway, not that that's necessarily always the case, but I think it's just something to be thoughtful about when we're thinking about our financial future. So, 
Great. Thanks, Lindsay, for sharing some some ideas and stats. I'm kind of halfway down the path to you on that. This is something that I should be thinking about. Great. How do I do it? So I've pulled together here for you some tips on how to negotiate your salary. So the first one uh, that I think is really important is you have to know what you want and you have to know what your non-negotiables are. And this is going to change over time. So I think when you're thinking about negotiations, you want to think about stack ranking, things like compensation, risk versus stability, work-life balance, the company, room for growth, and things like that. And this may change. Coming out of school, you might be more willing to take a risk on a startup that might be a little bit riskier for your career. After maybe coming back from having a baby, you may just want work-life balance and some stability to keep you grounded. Either way, when you're walking into the table in regards to the negotiation room, you want to understand where you're willing to give and where you're not willing to give and be really clear on that and be upfront about it too. And then I would also say when you're going into negotiations, make sure you're not putting all of your like rock bottom, this is the, like what I will take salary in, you're going to end up meeting in the middle between somewhere where your new hiring manager is looking to be and where you want to be. So again, this goes back to really important to know what's most important to you. Are you willing to bend on compensation? Are you willing to have a shorter commute? Make sure you understand going into the conversation where you, where you are on that. Do your homework. So this one may see a little bit, seem a little bit obvious, but now when you research online, you can find salary information everywhere. You can go on Glassdoor, you can go on salary.com, you can put it right into Google. I'd also recommend if you have friends and family and network that you trust and felt comfortable with, that you tap into your network. I have a lot of recruiter friends in my network and so I'll often ask them and kind of gut check whether or not something sounds like it's reasonable. But the information is out there and it's actually leaning more and more to being public. Uh, for example, Colorado is the first state that's passed a law that you must put salary uh, on the job description itself. So do your research and do your homework. So that way, when you're coming to the table, you have facts behind why you're picking this range. And you can also feel confident that what you're asking for is reasonable. And I would say the pitfall to avoid here is that you don't want to use emotion. You want to use data. And don't be afraid to sometimes ask people in your network. I know it's a sensitive topic, so don't just go running around asking anybody. But if there are people you think might be open and comfortable, it's another great way to tap in and see what, if what you're asking for is reasonable. So consider hidden costs and your current perks. I'm going to tap back to my example here while I went to Avon where I did not calculate the commuting costs and I did not calculate the difference in the state taxes. I ultimately ended up making less money. And I think here it's really important to understand companies are often offering a lot of wellness benefits. I used to get a free lunch at my job at FactSet. Uh, things like that. You also have to think about these benefits in terms of if you stop having them, how much will it cost you after in a post-tax dollar to cover that same cost? So free lunch that you get that comes out to maybe a $2,000 a year benefit and the company is paying for it, it's going to cost you 30% more on average at least to cover that 2,000 grants. You're going to need to make more than the 2,000 itself. So Anyway, something to calculate some of those hidden costs. They may seem small, but as I found out the hard way, and maybe you don't have to, they can um, add up. And it's important to make sure you're reviewing all the different pieces of your offer. Um, the fourth tip I have is write a script with all these proof points. So you've done your research, you understand what you're looking for and what your non-negotiables are. Write it out in a succinct script in terms of why you think that you know, you're know you someone who deserves this type of salary based on your successes, your projects. If you're just starting out from school, it could be projects from class. If you're further along in your career, it could be successful projects you've implemented at work. And then share some of those industry stats. You know, I saw on Glassdoor and salary that people are paying X from these types of companies. And this is about the range for this role. And then write a response for the hiring manager if they initially push back. So I say usually expect that you're gonna hear, well, we're at the top of our range and we don't think that you know, we're gonna be able to, to go any higher. Have a nice, succinct 
response for when that comes. Uh, and then the pitfall to avoid here, do not mention personal reasons for why you need the raise. Whatever's going on, it's definitely important, but when you're in the negotiation space, you wanna be coming from a position of strength and you wanna be sharing why you have value and tied into where you can make an impact and what's fair and, and reasonable in the marketplace and not so much in terms of your own personal needs, even if they may be there. Practice. So I think this is another important piece, especially I know for me in my journey, I was extremely uncomfortable. These conversations can be a little bit awkward. You're asking for something and it's probably something that you haven't necessarily had these conversations before with and it's high stakes. This is your salary, this is your future, this is your ability to earn and you're probably really excited about the position because you've gotten this far in the process. So practice what you're gonna say, practice with a friend, record yourself with all the zoom functionalities these days you can see exactly how you're coming off and then one great tip that i think that i found that's been helpful is to negotiate on the small things in your life where the stakes aren't as high so i practice with my toddler you know like you can have this cookie for that or not and it's a little bit lower stakes and that way i start to get used to feeling and how you kind of work through um difficult conversations so again Reiterating the pitfall here is similar a little bit to the one before, but anticipate that you know you might get some pushback and be really practiced in your response. I've pulled together a little sample script here. I won't read it word for word, but basically the person says, I'm really valuable, I'm a great fit, and this is why I'd be amazing for the role. Hiring manager says, this is the most we can pay. You say, I totally understand, and I'm willing to be flexible. But I really think that, you know, it'd be great to see if we get closer to the number that I'm looking for based on my skill set. Hiring manager says, okay, we'll go back and take a look. And then you say cool and calm and say thank you. And I think one of the important things I want to emphasize here is just staying to your script, being succinct, calm, and confident. They may say no, but then at least you have your answer. So which goes into the next point. You wanna ask with confidence and with clarity. You wanna come off confident, stay positive and firm. You don't wanna be pushy, stick to your points and let there be pauses in silence. So I know for me, this is one of the things that I've had to work on is I wanna fill that awkward silence. This is an awkward conversation. I wanna just put in a lot of words. This is not the time. This is something that's a business transaction and you need to stay focused on what you're trying to accomplish. You could lose your message and lose what you're trying to do if you're not staying on point. So let it be quiet. If the hiring manager, you know, takes a minute, it's okay. Let that be there. And then one thing that um, I learned in my research uh, coming up to this is there's a lot of value in candidates asking first. So the research they did, they said that the final offer amount was 30% higher when the candidate made the first offer. This is from the Lean-In organization. And I will say anecdotally, I have found this to be the case for myself uh, in my later half of my career negotiating, I typically knew what my value was in the marketplace. I knew what I wanted. And when they asked me, you know, like, what are you making? I said, this is what I'm looking for. And I put out a number that I knew would be exciting enough for me to make the move. So I'd already kind of set the tone on what I wanted right up front. And most of the times that's what I received. So um, I would just say, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. And then seven, I think one really important thing to keep in mind is you wanna continually always show your excitement uh, for the role, for the company, throughout the whole process. Like, yes, you're negotiating, but you're going to ultimately go work there with these people and you don't want it to get adversarial. So keeping it in a positive space, framing it in, how can we have a win-win here? I really wanna to come to a place where we both feel good. Studies have shown that even just having that more positive energy typically gets people to think more creatively. And instead of getting on the defense, your hiring manager might say, okay, great. So we can't do anything about salary, but maybe we could do something about vacation time. So keep that in mind, the positive energy and having excitement, you know, reiterate that, make sure you're making your employer also feel or whoever's, you know, you're negotiating with really good still through the process. And I would say here, I like to use the example 
of a marriage proposal. When you think about a company giving you a job offer, they've essentially gotten down on one knee and they said, you're it. We want you to come work for us, right? And you're saying, thank you so much. I would like a bigger ring. And it's not that you don't deserve a bigger ring, but you need to be thoughtful about how you approach that the same way you would with dating. So just remember that they have a lot in the stake too. They've probably gone to bat for you with their, with their managers and said, this is the person. So just keep that in mind while you're negotiating. I'm gonna leave you with these three final thoughts on this topic. Negotiation is a skill that you can learn. This is not something that I knew how to do. It's something that I've practiced. I had to write it down. I had to do it with a script. I had to talk it through and practice it in the mirror many times. And even now I still get a little bit nervous, but the more you do it, the more you can hone that skill and the better you get. The first time I negotiated, it was more like a couple thousand dollars. Now I've had a much bigger impact on my salary because I have a better attunement of that skill. If you never ask, the answer is always no. <laughs> so, and I think that's one thing too, is that you have to be open to the fact that you may hear the answer no, and that's okay. But if you never ask, the answer is just always no. And then finally, you are worth it. So I know for me, and I know from a lot of women that I've spoken with, having that kind of imposter feeling that like, could I really be demanding this type of a salary? Like, can this really be happening to me? Um, that goes through my head a lot. And I have a really great support network that helps me with that. And I think that's one thing that we really need to work on is that we do have value and things like women coming back from the workforce, you have things to offer you don't even necessarily realize. You're worth it. So give it a shot. And that's it. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We have two questions that are similar, so I'm going to ask them at the same time. Um, they're both from people who are currently in a job and are asking about asking for raises. And when should you expect a raise? And should you ask in COVID world? Is it fair to expect one? What do you recommend with raises once you're in a position? So that's, I think a great question. And I think, I think there's always an opportunity to negotiate whether you're in a role or whether you're coming into a role. I do think you have more leverage when you're coming in new to a role. That being said, when you're in a role, there's also still that opportunity. For me, I found it works best if you make sure you kind of start to walk your manager down the road before it's comp season because they usually have to start to socialize things like, hey, we want to potentially give this person a raise. And I think you come out at it the same way. You write down your accomplishments and why you think like which projects, how they made an impact. Don't assume your manager remembers all those things. They're doing 1500 other things. They're forgotten all about you. You need to keep putting it in their face in a nice way. <laughs> Um, but I would say it's pulling that together and then asking for what you want based on, I would do the same thing. Hey, market rate is paying, you know, X amount more for my current role. These are the projects that I have done and really nailed. I would really like to make X amount of more money and think about what you think might be reasonable within the constraints of what maybe, you know, a little bit, you know, like asking for a million dollars when you know, the company's only making X probably not the right thing, but again, do the research and then ask. And then. I would say, you know, it is, I have found sometimes it's tricky internally because it has to be built up. So just be prepared. If they say no, say, great, what do I need to do to be able to get to the next level? Because this is where I want to go. And that's, that's uh, how I would handle it internally. Great. Thank you. And do we have one that's um, sort of related? Um, this person is asking that they've completed an MBA while working part-time and while their work hasn't totally changed, how can they ask for more money or a raise um, at the same job, but they've now uh, gotten more skills or another degree? It's a great question. I think I would approach it the same in the same way. Pull out what about that MBA now makes you more valuable to the company and how you can do a greater impact based on some of the skills you've learned. And I would frame it that way and add that into your points of why it's really great. And ultimately it depends, you know, if, if you if you can't 100% get it where you are, you know, think about, you know, are there other companies that are really looking for people with MBAs? 
I know Danone hires people with MBAs specifically for certain roles. So that's another angle to go if you can't ultimately get what you need internally. If an employer asks for salary expectations in a cover letter, how would you suggest handling that? So um, in many states now, they're technically, you know, not necessarily supposed to ask you about your salary. Um, I have found on some application forms or, you know, potentially a cover letter, I typically put zero <laughs> um, because I think it's something that, you know, for me, I prefer to have a conversation about and understand more like, is there a range? What are we looking for? Or I want to, you know, do my research first. Um, so I typically, that's how I handle it. Great. Um, another question is, do you have any ideas or resources for how um, they can research the cost of living for a new area, not just the salary and how the cost of living might affect that salary in that area if they're moving to a different area? That's a really great point. And I would say there's a lot of websites that cover that. Um, I, I can't think of anything on the top of my head, but if you put it into Google and search around like cost of living in certain states, they'll run like all the stats for you. And it's definitely something that gets, um, that recruiters think about. I mean, I've been a recruiter myself and sometimes we're actually selling locations uh, that are, you know, have no state taxes or something like that because um, it's a lower cost of living. So to so do the research, I mean, if you're moving from one state to another, there should be general cost of living from like housing, from like average salary pay and that all, all online as well. Can you speak to students who are graduating or recent alums? Um, what kind of skills and achievements from a classroom setting should they focus on if they haven't had much work experience? Ooh, I put my uh, <laughs> student hat back on. I feel like it was just yesterday, but it's been a few years now. Um, <laughs> I think, think about, like, I would read the job descriptions of some of the roles you're looking at, but I know when I was um, an art history major, for example, uh, writing, I did a lot of writing, so knowing that I could edit, write really well, uh, presenting, teamwork, I used a couple examples of how I had to work with a team to be able to, you know, do a present group presentation together as an example of, like, how can you well collaborate with people? So I think, look at your background in terms of you have a lot of great skills, you know, that you're, you're using on a regular basis, probably like presenting, writing, um, collaboration and things like that and, and see how you can twist it. Thanks. We have another, um, it's like a two part question. Um, and it says, do the same rules of negotiation apply for internal promotions? And the second part is when you tar start talking salary, is it in the beginning of the process or do you wait for them to make the offer to you? So internally, I think, uh, I think the, same, the same rules apply. I do think that uh, internally, one thing I've, I found is that, you know, it, it might be a little bit trickier to have like a, you know, if, depending on where you are on the salary band, a, a massive, massive bump. But I do think that I would go for the same type of, here's what the market is bearing for this role. And here's what I think that I'm worth. Um, and how can we get me at least closer to that? And uh, I'm sorry, Kim, would you mind repeating the last part of the question? Sure, one minute. <laughs> Let me just scroll Cut down off card. <laughs> where it was. Hold on. Um, they wanted to know um, when to start talking salary. Is, can you start talking it at the beginning of the process or should you wait till they make an offer to you? So I think based on the research and the experience I've had that you should come um, prepared in terms of what you're looking for and that the research shows that typically you're going to get a higher offer if you go to them first and say this is what you're looking for as opposed to waiting for them to come back to you. You can wait for them to come back to you but the research has shown that you're likely going to be making you'll make you'll be closer to the number you're looking for if you go in first and ask. And I would also preface that slightly by it is also you know it's like kind of like playing a game of poker or something, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's a bit of a dance, you know, negotiation. So it's not always necessarily black and white. So you got to kind of feel it through. Uh, but I do think the research is pretty compelling around, you know, you kind of coming forward with like, this is what I really want. And then everyone's really clear towards what you're also, you're looking, looking for. 
There's a related question. Um, how do I know when to stop negotiating after how many rounds? When do you know that it's enough? That's a really great question. I think two things here. One, you have to read the room. So if someone is looking really uncomfortable and they're, you know, they've already gone to bat for you several times and you can sense the dynamic is shifting, um, I think you need to just keep a pulse, a pulse on that. Um, and two, I would say you don't really want to do a lot of rounds. You want to kind of be really upfront with what you're looking for. Maybe go back and forth once if it's not close to where you want to be. And then that's kind of where they're at. And the employer will typically let you know too, like this is where we've gone to. And when they say that, that's that's the time to like pull back and understand, you know, negotiation, you're not going to necessarily get everything you want. And it's about finding that middle ground. And I think that's really important to remember. Uh, so you don't want to just endlessly push it because you may end up with maybe a little bit more, but you have to remember you're going to work with these people. So I think that's where it's being really important, knowing what you want up front, saying, you know, getting as close as, to as, as you can, but doing a lot of back and forth is not a great place to, to get to. Okay, another question, um, and it says, this may sound ridiculous, but can I, but I never thought I could know she, I'm sorry, negotiate my salary as a nurse. And also, so this goes to, are there certain professions or industries that you can negotiate in versus that you can't negotiate in? It's a great question. Uh, from my experience, and I'll speak from my lens, um, you know, from like my recruiter hat and the different industries I've worked in, um, it hasn't, it hasn't mattered. I, I do think there's probably exceptions to that. Like maybe like, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, the military, uh, might have some set bands, but I think there's always a little bit of opportunity to be able to negotiate somewhat. And again, I think too, if it's not something that's possible, you know, I think it'll be pretty clear up front, you know, in terms of like, this is what we have, <laughs> You know, and even then, I think it still doesn't hurt to ask, you know what I mean? I think that's the whole thing, right? It doesn't, hey, is there any wiggle room on this? Or is there any more we could go up based on X, Y, Z? You know what I mean? And if they come back and say no, then you know. Uh, but um, from my experience, it's been something where like, there's usually a little bit of wiggle room. Um, granted, I've worked mostly in corporate, um, but I, you know, I've worked with a lot of recruiters. Um, there's usually a little bit of wiggle room. This attendee says, at my current position, I saw HR records and I know they were able to offer more than what they offered me. I did negotiate and received a raise recently, but still under that number. Is there anything I can do? This has led to me feeling not respected at work. That's a, that's a great question and definitely a little bit tricky because you definitely, it's, uh, you know, having insider information from HR is always a little bit touchy. Um, you know, I think if you could find the information, you know, out there and research it and say that this is really the going rate around it, um, that might be something to look at. But I think that's also probably an instance if they've just given you a raise, um, thinking through there is a finite amount of budget at a firm. If you're at a place like, you know, that's some industries, like, for example, in COVID right now, are doing awesome. Some are doing really con financially constrained. So I think think about the lens of which the bigger picture is, you know, in terms of like, are they just tighter on budget all around? May or may not be the case. Um, and then if you really feel passionately that, you know, this is, this is off, I think doing the research and going back to it, um, you know, to see if there's any more wiggle room could, could be good, but it is definitely something, I mean, citing HR information might be a little bit tricky and maybe not so well received in your negotiation rounds. Uh, but I think that's kind of how I would look at it. It's in terms of, um, addressing. Okay, so next question is advice on a workplace that will give you a title change, but no raise. So again, I think this goes back to, you know, what you're looking for. Um, if the title is really important to you and you, uh, you know, that's something that really matters to you, great. If compensation at this point in time is something that's more important to you, I mean, we all work to get paid. So that's, that's a reality. But there's, I think, multiple factors that go into a job offer. You know, I think if you are looking to take your next step and there, it's a title change and it's not necessarily moving you into a new direction, I think it's something to think about. So 
I think you'd want to look at where you are, where you want to go, and what matters most. Um, there's some companies and industries that pay at the top of the market, and there's some that pay a little less. But sometimes the exchange on that might be maybe you're better set up with leadership, maybe you're well positioned here, or maybe there's good work life balance. So I think you have to look at the whole equation of what you're really looking for. I'm going to go back to that example when I was getting divorced, higher compensation became more of a must for me. Um, I may not have been cool making quite an aggressive move if my financial situation hadn't changed. I had a great positioning at the firm I was at. Um, but I think that you have to look at it in terms of like what you're ultimately looking to do with the firm. How likely is it to negotiate fringe benefits like vacation dates? Are those normally standard or are those negotiable? So that's another great question. Um, I think in negotiations, you want to be creative. Uh, I've seen people negotiate vacation days. I think it's a great way to be like if a company has maxed out on their, you know, this is as far as we can go on this, you know, in, on the compensation, adding that as another thing in the ring to negotiate, I think is definitely something you can do and explore. And you can ask it in the right, I think in the right tone, you know, is this, you know, hey, alternatively, could we look at vacation or could I work from home a few days a week instead and we can, you know, help me feel more whole about the offer that we're trying to do. Um, so I think that's something to think about. I know for me, when I came back from maternity leave, I renegotiated how many days I was in the office because my situation had changed and it was just like a regular negotiation because it affected a lot of other things. And, um, you know, but essentially it was something that I was able to change the dynamic on and I brought research. So Great. We are, we don't have any more questions right now. So if anyone has more, please put them in the Q&A, but I think Dr. Schwab has a question or two. Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one, Lindsay, is that in a normal work situation, you get reviewed. Let's say there's the annual review. And let's say you're one or two years into working after graduating from college. And you get your review and your supervisor says, you are doing a fabulous job. You're just terrific. At what point should the person being reviewed speak up and ask for a potential raise, an increase in salary? Because that seems to be, it's like you get this big pat on the back, but there's no change in the financial. And so when, because that could be obviously a delicate time frame, but when would you recommend that the employee speak up? So I think always a great time to speak up is um, after you have a big win um, to kind of like set the stage or around a period of time where you know they're considering um, reviews and consideration. So I know for me, there's typically been a time of year where people are reviewed in a room and people look at your accomplishments. So I think making sure you express your interest, maybe you have a couple great wins under your belt and you're saying, hey, I'm really looking for X, Y, Z. And then you present that to your manager and then making sure you feed them regularly. Again, I, I, I think managers have a lot on their plate, making sure that like, especially when you know, I used to know when that meeting was coming up. So I'd make sure that I, you know, in my one-on-one -on -one with my boss, reminder of like kind of all him or her at the time, depending um, of the wins that I've had and, you know, and make it tailored towards the wins, not just I did this, but we were able to move the needle for the company and had X results. How can we do more of this? I'm really excited about how we were able to drive it forward and really tie it into like the greater good and give them talking points. That's how I like to look at it too, that they can go back to their peers. Cause you have to remember a lot of times it's not just a one-to-one -one conversation that they have to have. They have to tap into a larger budget. They have to compare it against Joe and Sue and all the other people that have also performed well. So there's that component to keep in mind. Um, so make sure that you have plenty of your kind of like continuing to share your great wins and think about the timing of your company uh, around, you can back it out from bonus season. You know, you can back out review season, look at your mid-year review, make sure you're teeing your stuff up all year round. So um, I think if you feel like you've been there two years, you've really made an impact and you feel like you've nailed your role, I think then that's, you know, if you feel like you've come to that position, that's a great time to, to ask for, for, for a raise. 
Okay. And just as a follow up, in case there there are there some more questions in the Q and A. Well, while they're looking, um, the a follow up is the role of your supervisor, who just as you've described, has to go to the next level and go to bat for you at usually at HR, um, and keeping that person informed. Uh, your advice on that, I'm thinking of this book, we've talked about it already, but not this evening. And that is a book by Lydia Fennett on you're the most important woman in the room. And it's, uh, she's done a remarkable job as a charity auctioneer raised billions. And she's pretty well known in the New York City area, but is hired by uh, nonprofits all over the nation. And she had, she wrote about her experiences and I think she was just in shock when she discovered somebody she had just hired was earning enough to buy her own apartment whereas Lydia was still trying to find roommates to pay rent and she realized, what have I done? And she began to really work with um, one of the supervisors who oversaw her area. And I think that person ended up really going to bat for her. So that awareness, that chain, right, is very important. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that I know for me has taken a bit to build the muscle, which I would consider that kind of managing up, mm -hmm. is that I feel like a lot of times women are always, um, I've read some articles about either they're doing work that's maybe not the sexier work to be seen, or they're not so great as when they do a win, they'll like tell five people and give six other people credit. And being your own advocate on that and making sure you want to stay in, I, I think saying I, I, I isn't necessarily the way, but saying like everyone else did everything is, you know, also detrimental to your success. You know what I mean? I think owning what you've done and what you're proud of and making sure you're advocating regularly, repeat the messaging. I mean, you, again, going back to like your boss also needs to go to bat against their colleagues and say, this is why. And if they have really great talking points, because you've made sure that the both of you know all the amazing work you're doing. Uh, you know, I think even on like my experience working remotely, you know, sometimes I can work on a project. My boss is doing six other things. And she may not know the full scope of what I'm doing, how much went into it, the networking that I had to do to get some things done. And I think that's where it's really important to help equip them to be able to go and manage up to you. And then also, I think there's a part of advocating for yourself over not advocating for yourself. If you're someone who's coming to them, they're going to remember you when they're like, okay, I've got five people on my team. Lindsay's been, you know, sharing a lot. I'm really confident about what she's doing. Jill has not really shared much. She does a great job. We know she does good stuff. Like you're, you're putting yourself in a better position if your boss, especially, um, and even some of her senior peers, like whatever you can do to kind of make sure that, you know, your face is associated with that win in some capacity. I had a boss that used to um, be really great at that. You know, she's like, we would have worked on something, but there was like a certain area. She'd be like, you send the email <laughs> because this is your program and we want to keep positioning you as the person that has been doing these successes. So thinking through things like that, I mean, I've been helped coached on that, but that's something you could do for yourself too is think of ways to, to, to make sure that you're getting the credit for the work that you're doing. I, I do see this a lot with the women I work with um, where they're doing a lot of heavy grunt work and then like someone else presents in a meeting and they're like, I did all the li heavy lifting for that. So I think it's a really important thing to think about because just doing the work isn't enough necessarily to get you to where you want to go. It'll get you to a certain point but then to really command, you know, further going further in your career, making more money, you have to make sure that it's a delicate dance. Again, you know, you don't want to be uh, you, you, like I, 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 but like, hey, these are the things that I am bringing to the table and making sure people know that. So. Thank you. We have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, Lindsay, if you become aware that there's salary differences in different divisions of your organization, and, you know, otherwise they should be sort of on the same page, one would think. How do you ignore the drastic differences between the salaries and feeling undervalued as a result? And this, um, the salaries were published, so it wasn't inside intel from HR. How do you say 
it was hard to see the salary differences and seeing where I fit in in all of that. <laughs> I know, um, so hard. <laughs> yeah, first off, and I definitely, um, I could, I could, you know, that would definitely not feel good if I saw, you know, people doing comparable work. I think it is important to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. So if you're in a, a back office function versus our front office function, we have marketers, brand marketers that go out and sell yogurt to all these people. I have a unique role in HR, which is a back office firm. So if you were to publish the salaries, I don't know off the top of my head, but they wouldn't necessarily potentially be, um, be equal. Um, that being said, I think that if this information is public and you're not feeling great about it, I think there's also having an open, honest dialogue with your supervisor or boss about how that makes you feel. And is there anything we can do about kind of closing these gaps? Or could you help me better understand why this person is making this and I'm making this? What's the difference? And they're I, not knowing what the backgrounds are. I don't want to comment on, it could be you guys are doing apples to apples roles and that's one scenario, or it could be that you're doing roles that have different financial impact. I always say, track the money back. What is hitting revenue? What is making the company money and what is costing the company money that, that will differentiate, you know, different areas. So, um, but that being said, I think, you know, there's times in my career where I found like speaking up and voicing my concerns and hearing the why behind something is a certain way has helped me like let go of kind of like a resentment I may have created that like, I'm not getting this because of X. And then my boss is like, well, no, we had to do budget cuts from here and here. And this is just the way it is this year. Don't worry, you're on the list for next year kind of thing. So clearing the air on that so that you're understanding why this is the way it is. And if you really want to get to where they are, uh, you know, asking your boss, like, how is this possible? Um, you know, I sat down with my boss several jobs ago and said, hey, I'm ready for a move. What do you recommend I do? I know there's no position on our team right now. What, what do you recommend I do? And he, he gave a variety of, asset. He, he gave me really great advice. He was like, try to grow your current role, try to grow and see what else is in the firm and look externally in terms of what is. So three-pronged approach. Because he's like, it, there's a lot of factors involved and you can use kind of each one of those. So anyway, um, I would definitely look to clarify so that you understand the why behind the way things are. Again, another uncomfortable situation, but kind of relates to the negotiation idea. It's also part of negotiating your worth is being able to say, hey, I see a discrepancy. Can you help me better understand this? Thanks. A couple more questions. I know we're kind of getting to the end, but maybe this question will kind of help others is um, you mentioned lean in and the most powerful woman in the room. Are there any other books or any other recommendations you can make on this topic to help further the discussion or uh, learning for our, our people who are attending? Um, I would say if you haven't read uh, Cheryl Sandbook's book, I think that's a, another great one. I know that's one that, um, you know, uh, it's gotten a lot of press and I think check out their website. Um, this one, uh, Women Don't Ask, which is actually uh, the updated version Professor Schwab plugged is uh, coming out from the Princeton uh, uh, review. So that would be another one to check out. And then Google, and I'm, I'm happy to share too afterwards. Um, there's some really great articles out there now. If you even just kind of search around with like scripts to really help you kind of get used to what you're doing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I would say those are kind of some of the main ones, um, that I've looked, that I would recommend. I would say one more, I think it's important because of the topic of women negotiating salary. What's the role you see for advocating for women in junior positions? Would you recommend that when you see a colleague is not self-advocating as well as they could? I love this question. I, <laughs> I'm here today because I'm hugely passionate about this topic. I have a lot of friends that have amazing skills that come to me and they don't think they're worth what they're worth. And it drives me crazy. <laughs> so I see this in the workplace too. And I think we need to help advocate and bring each other up in the workplace. So I've coached uh, more junior people saying to them like, hey, like, you know, so-and-so ran off and, you know, said that was, this was their work and it was clearly um, your work, you know, make sure that if you're spending time on something that it's something that, you know, you're also getting credit for and then coaching them, like 
hey, have you thought about what you really want in your career? Are you asking for it? Are you advocating it? I find with more junior people, and I relate to this, this is how I felt. I was just grateful to have a job. And I didn't want to ask for what I really wanted. So I would just tell you, I'll do anything you want, which is, which is fine. And when you're getting started, you should be open to taking on what's really needed. But I think there's also a line where we need to help younger women, especially when you're more established in your career, you can kind of bend backwards and um, help out others. I think it's really important that we're coaching each other. And when we see it happening, that we call it out in a nice way and be like, hey, have you thought about, I see you're really passionate about X. Have you let so-and-so know that you'd be interested in something like that? Sometimes being as simple as just even asking or putting it on the table um, you know, I know an example recently, someone was doing a recruiter job and they were really interested in doing a campus role, uh, but they said, you know, I can do whatever you want. And then I said, but what do you want to do? And then, you know, she went and asked for what she wanted. You won't necessarily get it. But I think when you spot that in the workplace, helping to coach and, and share with women, you know, like think about where you want to go. Think about the impact you can make on your career. Like, this isn't, um, you know, this isn't like growing up where like we're helping all each other. It's this is your career. So you have to think about it from a business lens and not necessarily about like, will so-and-so like you more necessarily uh, That's part of the game. But I think it's really important that um, especially as we go along in our career that we are helping, um, you know, the younger generation uh, teach them the skills, show them where they can, you know, better advocate for themselves. I've had a lot of younger women, uh, you know, even surpass me in my career after I've done some coaching. So I think it can definitely, you know, be helpful. Well, I want to thank Lindsay so much. You have been splendid and you've been very generous with your expertise and your insights. You've given us a lot to think about. And I know this is the, the start of a lot of conversations. They're ongoing. So it takes work and everybody needs to lean in on this one, right? And I also want to thank very much Maurice and Kim for your wonderful help uh, throughout this whole process and getting this organized and also for handling so beautifully the, the questions that were posed by our audience. So thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us and we wish you a good evening. Good night. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.